And then he's like, are you pregnant? And I said, yes. And he's like, how far along? I said, six. He's like, six what? Six weeks? I'm like, no, six months. <laughs> His jaw just dropped. He cried. He wept. I, think I also just want to know how you felt, right? Finding out you were pregnant and you're only 14. I think we need to own up to how we are engaging with our children regarding sexual activity. I've never had a child, so I don't even know what labor feels like, yeah, but yeah, yeah. the thought of a 14-year-old in labor, those you know what I mean? Pains. I can't imagine so, my daughter going right? through those It's pains. just that I took what was expected to be my downfall and wanted to show everybody that I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna make it, and I'm gonna be exactly what I want. Because to be. once you envision something, you know, you, you'll find yourself working towards it without even noticing. So these are the lessons that I would teach them. I'd give them examples from my life. You know, from my life. So, Tobias, thank you very much for, for uh, you know, agreeing to do this, to have this conversation. And I was just saying to somebody earlier that when we talk about Mother's Day or celebrate Mother's Day and we celebrate motherhood and mothers, how often do we actually have the teenage mother in mind? Like as challenging the people as with us, as like, you know what I mean? Or do we think of also what is the perception of a mother, you know, that we have in mind? It's the, she, she may not have it all together, but like she's that strong woman nurturing. She has it all together, has it all figured out, you know, but... In this conversation, I want us to just stop for a second and think about teenage mothers. So that's why I'm saying thank you for, for agreeing to do this. Because you you're one of those women who had a child in your teens, right? Before we get to that, I, I want you to, to just take me back to your childhood. What kind of little girl were you? Um, you know, with my childhood, I truly had a great childhood. I had an amazing childhood. Uh, my mother was a single mom uh, for most of my childhood. My mother got married when I was 13. So she was a single mom for many of those years. And, you know, it was great. It was just me and my mom. We were really, really close. We were great friends. Uh, we moved overseas for a few years. She was doing her master's. And then we came back and, you know, we continued that way. Then she got married. Um, you know, I have a great relationship with my dad, my stepdad. Um, I call him my dad, you know, I mean, he's, we have an absolutely amazing relationship. So for me, I can honestly say my childhood was great. You know, I, I never did want for anything. Um, my mother really did try to give me the best that she could. Um, or, and she also did try to explain to me, or, you know, there's a fine line between what your wealthy friends can get and what you can get. But she always did try and ensure that I didn't feel any kind of gap or a need for anything while growing up. Mm. Yeah. And and what kind of child were you, though? You know, like right now, just also just knowing you, I kind of feel you were talkative, you were going, like you were an extrovert. Am I right? Have I have, you always, I have been like, always been. I've always been out there. I've always been... You know, the one that will always say the most in the group of friends or the one that will always grab the attention or want, you know, to grab the attention or have a say in a conversation or whatever it may be. You know, I was very much out there. Um, you know, we were in the church as well. I grew up in the church. I grew up in church. And, you know, I used to be one of the kids that used to excel, you know, and and who, who the, yeah. You must lead by example. <laughs> I got the pressure. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So, I mean, for me that I cannot pinpoint for me where I could say the, the, the disconnect, there wasn't a disconnect with my mother, but I think in my life I can maybe say the disconnect was not having my dad around. You know, I did have a relationship with my dad, but it wasn't, I don't want to say it, it wasn't a bad one. Perhaps for me, I felt it wasn't enough. I was going to ask about yeah. that, actually. So how was that? You know, did you ever feel, um, you know, we call it daddy issues, right? Did you ever at any point, in retrospect, of course, feel like there was the need for a father around in those 15 years? Did you feel there was a gap? Did you ever feel neglected? Did you ever feel like something was missing, especially possibly looking around and seeing people from, you know, families where mommy and daddy yeah. were present. You know, I can't really say I felt like something was missing, 
But I think I would have liked to have had a better relationship with him, especially because I had siblings. Um, we were, I was introduced to my siblings who are my biological dad's kids um, at a young age. I think I must have been around 10 after before my mom and I moved to the UK. And that's when I was introduced to them. And them and I, we have been inseparable ever since. So for me, I grew up seeing the relationship that they had with my father. For me, I think it also may have triggered something in terms of the expectation of the kind of relationship I feel like I should have had with him because when I see how he is with my siblings. But, um, you know, I think one thing I'm always grateful for is that we were introduced to begin with and we were given the platform and the chance to have the kind of relationship that we do have. I think for me, the only sore point that when I think back to it, that I can remember for me being a sore point is when he would say he's coming and then he doesn't pitch up. Um, there was one specific day I remember when I was younger where I got really, really angry. And I remember my mom didn't quite know how to comfort me with that incident. So, you know, all she could do that day was just let me cry it out, you know. And I think for me, that's when the expectation of him being um, fully in my life kind of snapped. And, you know, I was just like, okay, yeah, it's cool. Mm. It's cool. Mm. Yeah. And at what point did you discover boys? Well, I've always known boys. (laughs) Go girl! (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) My mother would die if she saw this. I swear, I think I had my first boyfriend when I was in re- standard one mm. reception. There was this cute American little boy called Leroy. Yeah. And was that here or in the UK? It was here. Yeah. It was here. I used to go to a school that in the beginning, it was just me and four or five friends. Um, we started the school. There was some American baby doing Bama Kreste who come and... Um, I say, I say the Peace Corps. Uh, is, no. I wouldn't say the Peace Corps, but on, they were just kind of Christian. Mission. Okay, yeah, just these say, yeah, missionaries, Christians, yeah. missionaries. Yeah. They came and they opened a school. And, uh, you know, that's the school that basically I've been at that school my entire life. Even when we leave, every time we come back, I'd go, go back, back to, to that school, school yeah. you know. So I grew up there. It was um, Americans who were running it. And, you know, they. so there was the culture um, infusion. So I think, no, it was standard one, actually, when it just got bigger. Reception, it was just about five of us in the beginning. But by standard one, there were more kids. And there was this really, really, really gorgeous. I don't know if I, like I saw his really, picture really, now. Like, really? The thing is, I'm just taking myself <laughs> yeah. back to that moment. Uh-huh. I wonder if I saw his picture now, if I still think <laughs> he's that cute. He was yeah. that cute, yeah. you know? And I remember for me, I feel like that was my first interest in boys. I've always liked boys, honestly speaking. <laughs> you know? I love the honesty. <laughs> but, you know, and I think it, it takes me to, to uh, you know, a conversation yet again that I was having with, I think, my siblings and you know, cousins. And we're talking about how the, the nieces and nephews in my case their kids are so comfortable saying I have a girlfriend mm, I, have I have a boyfriend, boyfriend. you know what I mean actually that my nephew the other day said, you know what I mean my nephew actually mm. said oh you have a girlfriend Are how one be? You know, and we're like, so you actually have okay. more than one. But then in that moment I'm like, but we are the ones who are overthinking and sexualizing yeah. it. So I want to know what having a boyfriend as you were growing up, you've always liked boys. Yeah. What did that mean? You know what I mean? At like that age, were you yeah. Or, yeah. At that age, when I think of that first boyfriend, at that age for me, it was sitting to that, together at break time. Right? You know, him giving me a sweet at break time. That's what was happening then. Um, the stage of, you know, hiding behind classrooms and kissing, I think for me that started in when we moved to the UK. You know, yo, the, it's so forward out there. You, I, for me, I think those two years in the UK were like, woo, fast forward. Fast forward on a lot of things that I think had I been in Botswana, I wouldn't have been exposed to. Um, I wouldn't have tried out certain things um, at an early age had I not been exposed to them out there. Mm. Because, you know, yay, guys. It was a completely different world. At at 10, 11, yeah, 11, 12, they are doing things that even 13, 14-year-olds in Botswana are not. Even a way, you know. I had 11-year-olds, I could see 11-year-olds smoking. You know, I knew guys that used to smoke that were in my class. And it just was, so it was such a fast forward and shocker. And, you know, so it also speeds up the growing process. 
But yeah, I think that's where younger ones, I see it now with kids today. Younger kids, when you say you have a boyfriend, that's what you know, it's just that you know you like that one a little bit more than you like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, at what point did you then get in, uh, introduced to intimacy? You know, I don't even want to uh-huh. say sex yet because yeah. I like to believe there's a build up. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, you start for sort of discovering your body and your body's yeah. changing and you start feeling things, you know. So was that what it was? like for you um for me intimacy came in the uk we used to live in manchester and um i went i started my primary school life at manchester at a school called bowker vale and that's when i would say really now the intimacy began i think that's where i had my first kiss um ever with a boy when i got to the uk i think i was um about 10 or 11 years old at the time. Um, and yeah, I, was about, I was 10 years old at the time. And I remember I was so nervous. There used to be this boy called Sonny Scott and he used to have this gray hair right here in the middle of his head. <laughs> and, you know, he was the only other black boy in school. I and mean, it was just the two of us at the school who were black. And I used to hang out with these cool girls. Hey, Lebon, Hey, Hey, Spice Girls. Yeah. We were the Spice Girls in a break time and lunchtime. We used to dance for the school, you oh, know. So wow. people would come and gather we around cool, us. We, cool were, kids. we were the ones. Yeah. yeah. So people used to come and gather and watch us dance. And I remember this one time, they used to call, call it Go With Me. Like, are you going to go with me? You know, like, are you going to go with Sonne? And I'd be like, at first I was just like, what are they talking about? So there yeah. was this trend with them that at break time, they would go behind the classrooms. There's this little spot at school where you could hide. And for some apparent reasons, the teachers never, ever used to pass there. Mm. You know, even so after all of that So they probably didn't even time. know the spot existed? Or was so it like, that's okay, where, let's give them Yeah, so that's where we would go go with one another, yeah. Uh, which was kissing. So, mm. you know, you just stand there and kiss for however long you're kissing for and... And you go back and, you know, dance for the crowd. Mm. <laughs> like, it was so bizarre when I think about it now. Yeah. No. Yeah. Wow. So that's wow. when, for me, that's intimacy really came yeah. into the picture. Mm. Um, you know, I had to be explained to a lot of things by my friends at that age, you know. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons. I remember there was something that one of my friends uh, once asked me, actually. I think we were in a... I don't remember what class it was, but we, that day there were there was something about Botswana and the books, and they asked they saw some little funny hot house picture, and they asked me if that was my house, um, you know. And for me, I think that's when you know it kind of gave me the inkling that you oh so. You know, me coming in, not even knowing about kissing. This is what they think. This is hey, how behind wow, we are out yeah, here, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So coming from the stone yeah. age. So they felt they to things. take it upon themselves mm-hmm. to teach me every step of the way, you know, how you deal with guys, how you... Um, I think for me, that's also what changed my relationship with boys, just mm-hmm. being in the UK for that time. And now, when do you lose your virginity? Uh, and was it a... a um, you know, a conscious, I'm giving consent, I want to do this, you know, kind of vibes. It was uh, consensual. It was very consensual. I had been dating the guy for two years. Um, I think we started having sex a year into our relationship. Um, I was madly in love with him, whatever you could call love at the age of 13. Uh, But, you know, and... It, it, it's just, you know, I think any relationship progresses if you're with somebody for that long. And we progressed. He was a couple of years older than me. He was much naughtier than me. Um, and, you know, I was also, I remember I was scared, but I got to a point where I was comfortable enough with him because he had waited. Um, obviously, he he had asked mm. in that first year. You yeah. know, boys, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. will try his luck. But, you know, he waited. He waited for me to be comfortable. He was, you know, I honestly cannot say he was very gentle with me. I won't even lie to you. You know, I cannot paint him in a bad light today. Mm. Yeah. So. And was that in the UK or, you know, back no, home? No, that was back home here mm-hmm. in Botswana. Um, and at 13, I was here. 13. So you 13. lost your, your virginity at 13. Yes, I lost my virginity at And 13. when do you fall pregnant? I fell pregnant the... When I fell pregnant, the year I was turning 
Um, so that was that year. Later on, I had my daughter when I was 15. I'm going to get the timeline. Hey, so what I you were still 14 when you fell pregnant. I was still 14 mm. when I fell pregnant. So the year before when I was 13, turning 14. Yes, that's when I think we had started. And then the throughout the pregnancy, that throughout the pregnancy, we were broken up. Mm. Um, so yeah, so by the time I fell pregnant, I think by the time folks found out, that's when now everything started. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it was that year of 13, four, 13 turning 14. I want you to take us back there, you know, because I'm sitting here also just wondering, as you're having sex or when you start having sex, are you aware that sex can result in pregnancy? Very aware. You, and are you even worried about that? Or like you're saying, you're in love, you know, and as far as you're concerned, this is your forever. And how are you really, you know, processing yeah. all of this in that moment? Um, when you're in the moment of having sex, you don't process. Mm. Yeah. You know, for we had we were having sex for some time before I got pregnant. Um, I think when we got to the point where we were no longer using rubbers, um, I swear, I think probably I felt pregnant the first time we didn't use a condom. Oh, wow. I yeah, I honestly think so. Cause when I think about the time frame between then and finding out I'm pregnant and my mother finding out that I'm pregnant, and it's not long at all. So the, I swear that it probably is the first time we 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 stopped we did we didn't use our condom. That's when I fell pregnant, which must have been oh I'm getting early that January because if I had my daughter in November, you know, and it was just cha 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 from me. And I didn't you know I always knew like I said I was always a church girl at the church and we used to do these um there's organization called Hope Worldwide which was very small and I don't know if it was founded by Gerakeya my mom um Harvard International Church of Christ but I used to be part of it we used to volunteer we used to do HIV talks we used to educate people on unprotected sex and HIV AIDS and all of that so it's not that I didn't know So you really knew I what knew, you were doing I knew exactly and I what appreciate I was doing. the honesty you know and I think uh right now I'm just thinking about you know s- s- parents of teenagers right mm. Most of the time, I think maybe it's it's just acknowledging the growth, the transition. I think it really takes a lot for parents to 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 actually just acknowledge what it's getting when I get maybe sexually active, right? We so, need to own up to it we, as parents. Yeah, we don't yeah. what I realize is parents do not own up to it. Mm-hmm. Parents, um, you know, culture we've always grown up knowing and Parents really have not owned up to the fact that, you know, your, your, your child, when they become a teen parent, is because you are not owning up to the responsibility, not only of just educating them. You know, I was very educated on sexual activity and what makes you fall mm, pregnant. Mm, but here, then, that same person who's out there advising people and teaching people is the one that ends up falling pregnant. So I think we need to own up to how we are engaging with our children regarding sexual activity. Yeah. And how did you find out you're pregnant? Um, I think I missed a period. I don't know. You know, I actually can't quite remember. I think I missed a period and I took a pregnancy test. I can't even quite remember. Did I buy the pregnancy test? Did I was just about to ask buy that. the yeah. pregnancy test? Yeah. You know, I really can't remember very, very well. But then I found out I'm pregnant. But I kept it a secret for so long. Um, for my mother to find out that I'm pregnant, my best friend and I, you know, back in the day, um, if you pick up the other line that side, you can hear the conversation. The other yeah, lines. Yeah. So my girl and I are talking over the phone and, uh, you know, she, I think the mom picked up but and she overheard the conversation. One, two, one, two. I think we, my friend and I were coming from a tennis match. He tell her my mom's car in the yard. Yo, I knew instantly. <laughs> I was like, what time no. it was? Yeah, you but, know. But I, I think I also just want to know how you felt, right? Finding out you were pregnant and you're only fourteen. You know, of course, right now I can tell that you know this is something you've dealt with, and it's something that you know what I mean. But like, I, I'm literally thinking about a fourteen-year-old right now finding out they're pregnant. What are the emotions you go through? What goes through your mind? Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, I think, oh, you know, going back there, I think also sometimes you 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 block you block that it, yeah. moment. Yeah, for me it was fear more than anything else. I think I was the first thing I thought is, oh, my mother is going to die. You know, that's the first thing I thought. I think that's also why it took me so long to even try and seek help to tell her or to tell her. You know, I had no plan, but I just was not telling her. By the time she found out, I must have been five months pregnant. And imagine, I was like four months before. I, told her, I don't know what I thought. I don't know if I thought I was going to make some sort of plan. I don't know. I can't even remember what I thought my plan was, but I just was not telling her. I just kept putting off telling her. Um... And it was just, you know, it just started to somersault into a bigger and bigger and bigger lie. Uh, I think also she experienced her own trauma with finding out that I was pregnant. And I think with her, it was also about how long I kept it from her. More than um, even just the fact that I was pregnant at a young age. Um, So I was scared. I was scared. And I really, I just, I felt like, you know, once I tell her it's going to be over. My life is over. I think that's also why I kept it a secret so long. I was just trying to prolong, you know, the inevitable. inevitable. Yeah. And how did she react? She cried. And how, how did yeah. that conversation go, actually? I think I just um, need to, yeah. So you find her, she's waiting. You guys are coming. And, you know, you, you're you saying coming back from playing tennis. And I'm like, yeah. such a child, five months pregnant, but you're still playing tennis. I'm still out here playing tennis. I think it kind of speaks to yeah. your, you, you, you weren't even aware of you know what was happening like as of course you're young you know you're pregnant but like it's because i can imagine right now first of all pregnant i want to slow down yeah. and, you know what i mean no, but, funny enough yeah. even now with my pregnancies with my sons um i never did slow down so i've always been like a go 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 kind yeah, of person yeah yeah uh, but i think when we arrived there the thing that triggered me to know what she had just found out is when we arrived she had she was crying you know, she was crying and I knew what we thought there is no. So I I'm looking at my friend. I'm just like, yeah, tell them or what? You know, I don't even, I don't even know if, you know, actually, I need to ask this girl. I feel like she just told her mom because she just felt uh, like, you know what, this is getting out of hand. Your mom. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. my friend also was just feeling like this is going on for too long. Yeah. So I think the story of phone, you know, I never did ask. I think stories of phone is what she fed me, but she was just like, okay, we've got to tell somebody now. And the meeting was had. I got there and, you know, my mom was really, really crying a lot. She didn't say much to me that day. Um, by this time, also, my mom had already gotten married and all of that. She didn't say anything to me that day. I think my dad is the one who was speaking to me. You know, and the next day, I don't even know why. They 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 make me do a pregnancy test. Like, it's what I, they were just hoping <laughs> it's that it would come out. And negative. I'm assuming it's not even showing at that point. I wasn't showing yet. Yeah. I'm with... In fact, even my second born, I didn't show until like my seventh or eighth month. So it's um, one of those where I guess they just wanted... To confirm. Yeah, to confirm. Then we had to just take the next stages. My mom just went into a state of shock, if I remember correctly. Uh, We had that one conversation that next day when I think now she came to from, you know, from how she was feeling the day before. And for her that, I remember her telling me how she's done. You know, that she was done and she cannot. There's this place, um, we had some family friends whose children we used to help. And they would come live with my family members in the city. So she did say she was going to send me off there since I've decided this is what I want to do with my life and have, you know, babies at a young age. But then I feel like or this, you know, I can oh my gosh, what's the church going to say? What's, what are my friends going to say? You know, what's going to become of her and her life? I think for her, she, I can imagine as a mother now, or when you think, yo, what's now Tepiso's yeah. future from here? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I think this is where my stepdad, I think this was the defining time for our relationship also. This is where he jumped in and took the reins. I think, woo, my mom, honestly, Obviously, maybe she said some things, but I feel like we, she did not speak to me the entire time I was pregnant until it was time to give birth. Mm. That's where now I think just out of motherly instinct, you know, she jumped in. 
Ah, okay. I'm getting a bit. <laughs> I think this is the part I haven't spoken about much. You know, I talk about the mothering as a teenager, but not the relationship with my with mom. your mom, yeah. Oh, wow. And I'm oh. crying with you, of course. <laughs> Oof. Okay, yeah, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah, so I think for me, for her, I can imagine now as a mother, the pain she went through. Perhaps that's why I'm getting emotional about it 20 years later. So yeah, you know, I think we didn't speak much for those months. So for me, there was my bitterness to her not speaking to me. And I can completely understand what she felt now, now yeah. when, I, when I look back, you know. But back then, what did it feel like? Rejection? Were you? Did you miss that... Motherly touch in whatever form that you know. You know I sense think I also of, got yeah. into this angry mode as well. God knows why I was angry, but mm-hmm. <laughs> I got into an angry mode towards her. Um, get like a sympathizer, get like a shampa. This is it was, back then. Yeah, yeah. Get, get out then in that time. I remember I would sympathize because there was a time she had a mild heart attack at church. Um, and just also to highlight, we were pregnant at the same time. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. My mother was also pregnant. I think that was one of the biggest things as well for her that made it so difficult. You know, it was supposed to be her time. She had finally got married. She was finally able to have more kids. And here I am, so now taking the shine of her pregnancy. It's supposed to be a joyous time for her. You know, she's having another baby. And um, my sister and my daughter are... When is my sister Kanti? May, June. <laughs> but I think they're also about six or seven months apart, my sister and my daughter. Yeah. So we were pregnant that same year. Oh, she's in April? No. Somewhere there, April, May. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's a little more April. And then, you know, I'm having mine in November. So that uh, pregnancy of her, she finds out that her daughter's pregnant. She's going towards, she had a mild heart attack in church from that, you know. So for her, it was just a very traumatic time for her as well. And I think this is where now, you know, her containing herself from keeping a distance from me, um, that was her way of dealing. I remember the, the time where we started to speak again is when we were getting ready for my uh, labor process. We had some medical aid issues because I was a dependent. So a dependent having a baby wasn't really covered. So I had to have my child in South Africa. We had to cross over to my Fike. So when we started doing those final monthly visits, um, at the end of a pregnancy, there's that one, I think it's weekly visits. Um, that you start to do. Mm. And this is where now she started taking me cross-border so we can go and do them. And there was this one visit, I think we were both unprepared. That day we had gone for a visit and the doctor just felt like, you know what, you can give birth today. You guys shouldn't shouldn't be coming back every week and back both, and forth. Yeah. And then, boom, he pops just a like pill that. up inside of me to, to induce labor. My mother's shocked, I'm shocked. I think this is where now we probably start talking to one another. She's shocked, she's, you know, oh my gosh, why did you let them, why didn't you come out? She just like, yeah. no. Yeah. And I think this is where now we started to interact and Lena, she just kind of, you know, snapped out of where she was at at that time. Um, luckily, we had family, Mama Fiking. Um, my mom's side of the family is from that side. So we had some family in Mama Fiking. And my aunt was a midwife at uh, Victoria Hospital where I was given birth. And so, you know, we roped her in. I guess also her seeing her daughter in labor. You know, she started the, the motherly thing came Instinct back. Instinct just came yes, yeah, it, it, it came back. back yeah. And, you know, she was there. She was holding my hand. We were, we went through it, just pleading with them to give me something for the pain, you know, and... <laughs> I cannot even begin yeah, to imagine, so, like, what are you, I've never, of course, I've never had a child, so I don't even know what labor feels like, yeah, but yeah, yeah. the thought of a 14-year-old in labor, you know what I mean? Pains. I can't imagine so, my daughter going right? through those pains. Yeah. What was that like? Um, For me... It was, that one was pretty much a daze. I think after maybe a couple of hours, I remember the labor pains I was going through while we were still in the mall waiting for the pills to kick in, you know. And 
those ones, I, I remember them. They weren't so horrific. It felt more like excruciating period pains. And we, once we got to the hospital, that's when now it was, woof. I remember certain intervals of that labor. I think once she asked them to do something, they put me to sleep. They put me to sleep until it was very short between the time I remember coming to and having to actually now push and give birth. Um, so yes, they did give me something to sedate me. I think I did get sedated. Mm. Um, what I remember in the intervals is, yeah, I wasn't really managing. Um, you know, I think there was, yeah, I wasn't coping much. You know, But you delivered naturally. I delivered naturally uh, with, yeah, with a lot of help from the doctors, obviously. Luckily, like I was saying, my mom was there. My, you know, the lady, the nurse, the midwife assisting was my aunt. Yeah. So there was a lot of, you know, support, support yeah. with that. So yeah. for me, I think... I did. Happy I've always been a resilient person. Now that when I think about yeah, it, you know. So, clearly. Um, even with my other kids, my, my friends always laugh at me or I'm that kind of girl who I'll be like, okay, friend, I'll call you back, but I need to push. <laughs> and that's actually <laughs> happened with one of my sons. I'm like, okay, I need, I need to, to push. push Imagine, now. <laughs> wow, girl, I want to be like you. <laughs> so it, it was, I think, um, I don't know, maybe my threshold for pain is high. Yeah. yeah and, and maybe, you know, uh, are you spiritual? Like, do do you believe in getting Wanakanya? God will not give you what you cannot thank handle. Thank you. Um, I do. I do. I think that's one of the scriptures actually that I regurgitate to myself very, very frequently. And, you know, I've I've read the entire Bible. I've read the entire Bible. I've been a, they call them home cell. Um, they call them we used to call them Bible talks in my mother's church. I've been a home cell leader. I've been, you know, I've, I've been in and out of church a lot. I've always found myself drawn to church. Um, but now in my older age, I'm finding myself being drawn to a feeling more than who or what I am worshiping. It is more of a feeling and a spirit that resonates with what I, what my reality is. So I think the past few years is where I've been finding myself transitioning into that. I still love church. I watch sermons every morning, uh, you know, and even if I'm not going to church in an interval, I stay praying. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I'm not the most Christian-like mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. But I believe, what, you know what, now God is always with me. Um, now in my, in my getting older, I've started to believe my, my ancestors are always with me. Um, you know, one person for me that I always tend to feel like I'm feeling and is guiding over me is my grandmother. We had a really amazing relationship. Um, she passed away when I was uh, pregnant with, was it not pregnant? Yes, when I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm. That's when she passed. And I was wish she had just survived to meet her, you know. Yeah. So for me, I feel like she's always kind of been there, you know, with, over the years. I've never quite known what it was or... Yeah. You know, maybe now that's what I'm choosing to believe as I'm getting older. But I am a spiritual person. I believe in a spiritual feeling, spiritual being and spirituality. Yeah. And now you have a baby. There's a little person here and they're all yours. Yeah. And you have to become a mother. What was that like? Were you even able to comprehend it in that manner? I yeah. always loved kids. Because I can imagine, you know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I always loved kids growing up, also because I was an only child for so long. So I really, really loved kids. And I remember one of the most difficult conversations we had with my mother that also worsened our relationship is um, there was the idea um, that my mom had brought up what we should say the baby was hers since she was already having a baby that year. Mm -hmm. And they would adopt the child and th the child would grow up as my sibling. And I said, no, I refuse. I said, I can't. I can't do that. If Yeah, she's going to call me mama. And I remember I was always adamant about that. Or no, she's going to know I'm her mother. I don't know why I, I can say I made that decision Maybe I, I couldn't imagine after that all matter. of that pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the kind of like me that hi nana, you know, hi <laughs> nana <laughs> from a distance. Yeah, I, you know, I think I don't know. I can't quite. Um, for me, I think this is where then the spirituality comes in. There was just something that was telling me, or no matter how much this gets you into trouble, this child is going to be yours. Mm -hmm. 
you know, in some way. Obviously, my parents were going to have to take care of the child because I had no way of taking yeah, care of the child. Yeah. But in my head, I was just telling myself, you know what, I'll make a plan. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to manage, you know. Um, but, you know, this brings us back to my dad. You know, he, well, no, that man fought for me. He fought hard for me with my mother. I'm sure they probably had issues yeah. over how much he was fighting for me. Mm-hmm. And when I think about it now and... If my husband was out here, his side. Even now, we argue about our daughters. You know, him taking the side that is not mine. Mm, so so can I can imagine, imagine what they were going through. Yeah. But I'm going to private school because I think she wanted me to go, not to go back to private school, but rather go back to government school. He fought that battle. I went back to private school. Um, you know, and so. As we were going like that, after making that decision, this is where now my my dad comes into play and he had to take the forefront in terms of parenting me and ensure that I stayed in private school, ensure that my mother allowed me to go to university outside of the country because yeah. I ended up so going you're, to university. So like, in, in essence, he just wanted you to still live to a still full live, life, still have yes. access to all the opportunities yes. you would have, yeah. you know, if things were different. If, if things had stayed yeah. the same without yeah. me having a baby. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he always fought for that. Even now, you know, I, I see him still fight for that with other people that you know what everybody deserves a chance you know he he's a he's very big on chances very very big on chances so you know he he fought for me and you know i can never thank him enough for that mm. yeah so so you know from what you're saying i was going to ask you about that because the reality uh especially back then right is th- there was the concept of kids dropping out of school because they, you know, felt pregnant. I'm not picking that up with you. So I think I just need to understand, did you continue with school throughout your pregnancy? At what point did you take a break? If you had to take a break, how long was that break? Also, how was school life for you? You know, were you pregnant at school and just loved up? Was there any shame around being pregnant and at school? I was pregnant at school, but like I said, I wasn't showing I left school. In fact, not even I left. When I told Nerutonzo Kuala from Fife that year. And my principal, the same man that's been seeing me since I was five years old when I met Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, calls me into the office and asks me why I'm being withdrawn when we're supposed to write in just a few months. Uh, my form five, you finished the school. You know, obviously he suspected what there must be something. It was a Christian school. Nobody could know I was pregnant. That was one thing. Nobody could know I was pregnant. I had just a couple of friends that knew. My best friend at the time, and another girl um, I used to hang out with all the time. She was, you know, they used to call us Blondie and Spikes back then. She was um, another South African girl. And those are the only two people that knew I was pregnant in the school. And... When the principal called me and asked me why I'm leaving, and I'm just sitting there, you know, silent. I'm like, do I tell him? Do I not? What did my mom say? You know? Mm-hmm. And then he's like, are you pregnant? And I said, yes. And he's like, how far along? I said, six. He's like, six what? Six weeks? I'm like, no, six months. <laughs> His jaw just dropped. He cried. He wept, you know? And it also makes me emotional thinking about him because they raised me. Yeah, you know, yeah from, so he literally yeah, felt like a Yeah, 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 you know. I remember his name is Mr. Perry. And he saw me actually uh, when I was pregnant with my second son. When was that? Three years ago. Well, yeah. How long is pregnancy? My son is three now. He saw me and he, they came back to Africa. I think they left some years ago. They sold the school, the learning center. And they came back and... Um, we, we, we got together, you know, the, the people that were of that class, the ones that were with them since reception. Mm-hmm. And we sat there and, you know, he, he was just like, wow, look at you now. You're married. You've got kids now. You've got a family. You're doing well. And he was really happy to see that that didn't define my the rest of my life, you know. So I remember he cried when he found out. Then he called um, his mother-in-law, Mrs. Simino. She came into the office. They all cried. They all had a thing. We, we actually ended up having a dinner for them. They did a farewell dinner for me. Uh, as I was leaving the school, just privately at home, um, at their home, uh, just to say, okay, good luck and and whatnot, you know. So I was there until six months pregnant. I think actually I left just as I was getting into seven months pregnant. And then because the exam was killing, 
October, around October, November. October, November yeah. Yeah. So by October, I was out of school. Uh, or no, by September, September, that's when I left school. Mm-hmm. And then, yes, had the baby November, December, January, went back to school in February. Yeah, I went did back you have to, to repeat? in February. I did have to repeat. Mm. I did have to redo my Form 5. There were talks of either me writing as a private candidate, but uh, my stepdad was like, no, let's give her a chance because if just being pregnant might affect her. So I don't know. Rather, I'm going to go to next year to avoid failure and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, I had to go back to a different school, though. I couldn't go back to learning center because it was a Christian school. And, uh, you know, it just wouldn't have been right for the school. And I knew and I understood. So I changed schools um, and then I went to go repeat Form 5. Mm. So, you know, I think from what you're getting, and I think possibly... Uh, you were very fortunate that you didn't show. Yes. So the biggest struggle was, of course, internally with family. Uh, so one one of the things I wanted to find out was whether you ever felt rejected by society at any point during this journey. You know, as you were pregnant, did you ever feel a sense of, uh, you know, inadequacy, any kind of shame? Or didn't you deal with it because then you weren't showing? So the only time that I, think I didn't got to, deal with it because yeah, I wasn't yeah. showing. And also for me, I think the naivete of being a child, you know, yeah. it's just quite sort of one. I had like, you're in trouble today and then you move on. With yeah, life. yeah. Think, so that's really how it was I for you. I think that's as well. how it was. So I think the also because you're young, you're probably not able to yet again. I was you know, not dwelling on it. Yeah, at yeah. When I remember correctly, I was still laughing with my friends at school. We were still hanging out. We were like, I can't remember a time during my pregnancy where I was feeling down and depressed. I think for me, the actual reality came now when the child was there. Yeah. When the child was there, I do remember intervals where it was bad. But can know? I then ask you this? Uh, and I know you've done a lot of work now, you know, with, with teen moms, right? Do you believe your reality is the reality of uh, oh, your experience, right, as, you know, a teenage mom, you know, pregnant throughout your teens and, of course, having a baby that young, is the reality of that girl, that girl, primary or, or secondary, you know what I mean? Like, do you, from what you've seen, from, you know, the research that you've done, the engagement that you've done, do you in any way feel possibly you were kind of privileged? You came from a warm, you know... Yeah, I was yeah. privileged. Mm. For me, I was privileged. I, I really cannot say no. Everybody has the yeah. same. We don't yeah. have the same chances yeah. in life. We really don't. And for me, I just think also the root of it, more than having the money for private schools or had it been a government school or government scenario with the same kind of support from my dad. I think I still would have strived to ensure that, you know what, he's fighting this hard for me to stay in this house and I better make sure that, you know, I do best by him. He's out here fighting for me. So I think it's about the support you're getting from your family and your surroundings and the people that are in your life more than it is about whether there was money to pay for a private school. That's it. Because even if you can't go to a private school, is it GSS or, you know, whatever senior secondary school, you can go back. If your parents say go to school, I'll get that. So it is and about that more than it yes. is about, you know, any other circumstance. The support you're getting. How was motherhood? And, yeah. you know, God gave you a girl. Did oh, you, how was, you know what I mean? So I can only imagine, <laughs> did you at any point in raising her ever, you met, like worry about her becoming a teen mom? How was raising her? Every single day of her teen years for me was sheer torture. Sheer torture. So by the time she was a teenager, she was obviously living with me. You know, I started living with her on a full-time basis when she was 10 years old. Um, when I, w- I went to university when she was two. Um, those first two years also for me were very hard in the sense that you know, our helper, our helper at the time, in fact, you know, she was with us right up until I was pregnant with my three-year-old. 
that's when she left the family. So she was with us for a long, long time. And she would always remind Zanela. Zanela is my daughter. She'd always remind her, you know, your mother used to study for Form 5. She used to, my dad used to have this footstool. And Zanela had colic. So she wouldn't sleep at night. And she would be screaming. And the only time she was sleep is when I'd have her on my lap. I used to have this pillow and I'd have her on my lap. And then I'd just dangle my boob over her face and she would breastfeed while I'm studying with the footstool, you know. And... I remember my, 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 our helper would always remind her because she always wanted her to focus on school. She, she has this tendency to be lazy with things. She's very intelligent, but she's very lazy, um, which is probably my doing. And, you know, she'd always remind her, your mom went through this and, you know, she passed from five. I was one of the only ones that passed from five in my year and was able to apply for government sponsorship with the form five results. Everybody else had to do form six because their results were not qualifying, you know. And when I did my Form 6, it was just because my mom was like, if you sit around, next thing, or Santo it's a gap year, next thing you'll be popping out another baby or now. <laughs> yeah. So I failed Form 6 dismally because next time I accept the local school and everything, it's all right, I'm just buying time. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah. So our helper would always remind her of that. And in her teen years now, you know, when she was giving me all of these issues. So raising a teenage child, was traumatic because since she was, I think Lenny she started dabbling with Boto Tuliba Sima and around about the same age as me, Bote Nebo. That's when I started to notice a shift in her and her interest in wanting to look pretty or wanting to, you know, go out with friends and start lying. And um hey, so yeah, it was a tough one. And what kind of mom were you? Because I'm also sitting here thinking you were only 15 years older than your daughter, Ooh. right? So, so I still am only 15. You know what I mean? Older. You still yeah. are, right? Yeah. So, so what kind of, especially now with you know your trauma and not wanting her, you know, to end up being a teen mom, were you strict or did you then have to build a relationship with her where she could trust you? Yeah. Because I, you know, I'm literally just wondering how you were able to navigate that. Yeah. I used to be very strict. I think in the beginning, uh, in my 20s, I can't say, hey, in my 20s, it was touch and go. I can't say in my 20s, I had quite figured it out yet. So when we started living together, um, she was nine, 10 years old. Um, I must have, been, what was I, 24 at the time, you know? 24, I've just started working at Yarn FM. I'm a radio presenter. Life is nice, but then I got a mother this you know, 10 year old, <laughs> all in, all at the same time. So for me, a lot of it was the parenting style that I understood, which was my mother's parenting style. Um, but also luckily it was diluted quite a lot by my dad's parenting style. Um, because then when he came into the picture, he's the one that added that nurturing, you know, as much as we women are the nurturing ones, yeah, my mother is very... I don't know if it also was just because she also had to do a lot as a single mother, but she was very hard. You know, she didn't have that softness. In fact, my dad is the one that had that softness. Mm. And, you know, so taking the two of them and combining the two of them was a little bit difficult for me. It took some time for me to navigate, you know, um, Yo, it took a lot for me to navigate because she she got in, we 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 have these episodes her and her, her and I where we just disconnect, and it's always times where she goes through growth spurts and she's getting into the next stage. When she was a preteen, becoming a teenager, there was the growth spurt journey of just you know phones and sex. Ding, what do they, yeah, sexting, mm. and this is where she starts these things. And then, um, you know, little lies, halele, hale, you know, ma ganyan, hey, zanele, ma ganyan. <laughs> I remember this is what we always used to say, or yo, ma ganyan, zanel. Mm. And it was very, very difficult in the beginning. But I think for me, by the time I found my balance was only when she was, now we're already. Are we already married with my husband? Um, I remember there was, I think we were, how old is she now? 19 going on 20, 19, 18. Yeah, we were already married. So she was about 14, 15. And uh, this is where now we decided, you know, she had started sneaking out. Manole, she's tiny. She's short. She's really tiny. Manole now, electric fence. 
I don't know how she did it. In fact, for us to learn, I don't know if I should say this out there because I don't get that with Google security. Yeah. But she taught us things that we couldn't have even fathomed or knew existed from her eagerness to sneak out. And it started to get really, really scary. I remember I was pregnant with her brother, who's now nine years old, you know, and it was a difficult time for me because I remember I cried so hard that day. Usually she would sneak out and come back the next day. She was going into day two at Zamaile and I was just losing it. I was just losing it. And then soon after that, she was running away from home. She's going to stay at some bachelor pad there with some boys. And, you know, I had to go and fish her out of there, find her, track her down. So this is when I realized that something's got to give, something's got to change. And in my head, I'm thinking, this is exactly how she's going to become a teenage man as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my husband and I just decided, let's just negotiate with her. Mm -hmm. You know, let's find a balance. Let's negotiate. Um, You know, you tell us what it is you want. You set the rules. But now you can't break your own rules when you set them. So we sat down and because we tried it all, we went for therapy, counseling, Mm. until we sat down with her and we said, okay, let's cut a deal. We're willing to cut a deal. How many times a month should you be allowed to go out? We negotiate, we found a balance. What should your curfew be? We negotiate, we find a balance. You know, we should always know no matter what, where you are going, who you are with, and we promise we will let you be. You know, we had to cut certain deals with her that were making it, we would give us peace of mind but we'd also know that we had the capabilities to protect her because as soon as we did that, you know, it it, it started to heal or fix certain scenarios because now we'd know where she's going. Um, We'd we'd know what, okay, if it got bad, no matter what, she will call, you know, and and it actually did work because in scenarios where she would go to a party and no matter what time was, I've woken up at 3 a.m. to go dig her out because of she knew she could dingy trust scenarios, you, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, I've had to hold on to some friends of hers who had lied to their parents about where they spend the night because, you know, I can't take my daughter and leave this other young girl there. Get in, yeah, nah, ma, I can't account for you. What if mm. she gets raped? The reason Zanela's calling me is obviously because they need to get out of there, you know. So I had to parent in a more friendly kind of way than a, than, a, than a parent kind of way. Because even when we made the decision, I hope she doesn't kill me for saying this, but she was going to become sexually interactive. You know, I, I had to have the talk with her around about the same age I had her. And all I asked her for was, the day you decide to have sex, no matter when it is, what is happening, all you have to say to me is, Mama, I'm ready. Let's get you ready. Let's get you on contraception. Let's get you understanding how condoms should work. Let's get you, you know, I said, this is all I am asking you for. And I promise you, I will not ask you a single question about it. And I actually remember the day she said to me, I'm ready. You know, because I'm in the car. She's like, Mama, uh, remember that time? I said, I must tell you that I'm ready. So I'm ready. And I'm just like, huh? No, no, no. I think it was a couple of years after I had uh, had that talk. So I'm so lost. She's, so she's just trying to remind me by not Without saying the actual detail, word. Yeah. She's like, Mama, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> And then it, it clicked after, you know, a couple of I'm ready. And yeah. I was like, ah, okay. You know, did your heart sink or was it one of, was it a It did sink. Relief? I, I yeah. felt myself panic and I mm. remember telling her that I would not, you know, persecute her. her. I wouldn't you wouldn't ask yeah. her any yeah. questions, but I would at least take her through the process of, yeah. um, you know, what is the next step, yeah. you know? And... I remember when I when I I took her to a private doctor first, hello, you know, worry, to get her started on contraception and counseling for sexual health, reproductive health, and all of that. But and then thereafter, I told her you're gonna have to work for it. You're not gonna use medical aid to get your contraception. So once every three months, no we do hello, or as any hello, I'll fall, I'll go guy, and we'll follow all day. <laughs> You're oh, like, it's wow. not going to come that easy, yeah, baby girl. I was yeah. just setting you up so you can, you know. Mm. And luckily, we have these places, you know, these youth centers that will assist a child. I get it usually if a child is um, under 16 or is it under 18, they are not allowed to be given contraception without consent. And for me, because I had already started my teen mother program when I had moved back here, I, I knew that 
it goes and and you know I knew about these youth centers and this is where children can at least secretly receive help mm. to avoid teenage pregnancies you know this is where these are the places that help to change the norm about contraception not being given to a girl child um below a certain age mm. and because they would give you your contraception from 14 15 it was actually not allowed mm. to be receiving contraception at and uh, I think it's actually under 18. And I, I've never understood why. Because I remember when I was 15, 16, I had to go to these youth centers, Gassipiri. Even though we had had a baby, my mother still believed that I was going to become a virgin again <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, which I found I was baffled. But yeah, she truly, truly believed what it back here, and I'm never going to have sex again. Yeah. But yeah, so I had to find these places as well for myself for to ensure that you know, I don't become a teen mom again. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to finish school that year. Obviously, yeah. as much as I've had a baby, you know, I will meet somebody. That's you it. know, of course, yeah. Of course, it's only natural that you Yeah, then, so I will yeah. meet some. So I did meet somebody in that year. I was repeating from five and we dated for a couple of years, right through until the form six. But that is separate. Like, or we went to different universities, you know. So this is the process I took Zanele through. And, um, you know, she's turning 20 today. And the last happy even when she had a brother, I made sure she knows how to feel to have a baby. So that she was that's like, having a small baby. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, so, you know, I think we didn't touch on this and I, I want us to just, you know, quickly go through it. Just let us know how that worked. You mentioned earlier that then when parents found out your relationship ended, uh, was Zanela's father present throughout Zanela's life what has the relationship been like? And would you say it was because of the fact that you had her so young as, you know, you know, a unit? Uh, so p- perhaps just get us into that. Um, yeah, you know, luckily I've, we've already had this conversation with her, but I remember it was one of those that hadn't been had before. But when I was pregnant, as soon as parents found out, they became, but then he never denied he was the father. But when the parents came into the picture, I don't know if he denied it, but the what I was being told was that he was denying it. Mm. Um, his parents, he was Zambian. His parents shipped him off back to Zambia. We continued to speak over the phone throughout my entire pregnancy. Oh. I think right up until maybe the eighth month. And we lost touch. Um, I had Zanele and then... There were some incidents where apparently my mom had told me or they had said they wanted to come and see the baby just in case it was their child. And my mom felt very offended by that. And, you know, my parents just decided, let us just leave them alone. Mm -hmm. They are not making effort. We're not going to bug them. Um, It could be traumatic. I remember that's one of the things also my dad was saying, oh, gonna because then I was fighting, get no, he didn't deny it, obviously, mm. to me. Get no, course, you know, yeah. he agreed it was him, he agreed it was him. You know, obviously, being young and, and foolish, I just thought, okay, yeah, maybe we'll have this baby and be together forever again. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, mm-hmm. a problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, and and I think this is where my dad just sat me down and he said, Look, for your own sanity, for your own happiness, let us leave these people alone. Yeah. We don't need them, we don't need whatever little measly thing they want to bring here to check if it's their child, if they do not believe us. Because I think the Baba really about a paternity test. I don't know. Maybe that's when paternity tests were still super expensive or something. Um, so, yeah, that's where it was cut off. But gradually over the years, halele hale, there were sporadic times when he would reach out to me. I think I remember the first time was when Zanele was about four years old. You know, come to think of it, I think that man just reached out because now we're not a casual. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it was never been about the child. Like, it was the year I met my husband. I didn't know it. Yeah, it was the year I met my husband. She was four years old. Yeah. You want to put that two and two together. <laughs> she was four years old and he reached out to me all of a sudden now taking an interest in Aaron Zali, and you know, I've been doing a great job and she looks just like him. Like oh, she is wow. the sp- The only difference is she's light-skinned and he's very dark, you know. Mm. Um, Because he's lighter than me. I don't even know how that happened. But yeah, so, and it was then, so every few years, then they were, I think when she was about 10 now, when I was in the 
uh, thick of being a single mother now. I got, I had taken her, I was living alone with her. Cause I remember when I took her, the one thing I made sure is that when I take Zanella, I wanted to relieve my parents of the responsibility. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I made sure I worked out to ensure that I was working and I would live away from home and I would help and pay her own, pay her yeah. school fees. And I think I just finished with her school fees, like paying off her school fees debt, like probably last year. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, those yeah. are some of the things yeah. I ensured what I also wanted to do for my parents when I took her. Um, so in those years, yeah, like then I like if you look even about like much as a maintenance the past <laughs> twelve <laughs> years, <laughs> yeah. you know. But he's all the way in Zambia. I remember trying to go to maintenance court and figure out um, how to go about it, and because he was not in the country, it 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 just was not working for me. My last straw now, where I was like, we are never going to communicate again, was uh, in twenty. 13 maybe, or 2014, I went to Zambia for a friend of mine's wedding and I told him I was coming and he said, okay, you know what? Let's finally link up and talk. Yo, that guy went ghost oh. on my life. Oh, I was my. just like, well, and this is when, you yeah, know, like, no, up. or maybe Linda Nikim was in press. Happy, you know, when you're this radio life, I had a show that uh, that used to make me travel. So I'd get like the most expensive hotels to accommodate yeah. me and I'd feature them and I'd do coverages of them. So maybe they came because you know I, mean? I said he was so going to more. where I was staying. Yeah. You know, and mm-hmm. I could see Horlen, his life maybe didn't quite pan out the way the parents had hoped it would pan out yeah. by yanking him out of being a teen dad. Because like, you know, it was a case of, you know, that is damaged good. You don't want all the way. Because yeah, he did but, go yeah. ahead and have a family and I remember I used to stalk his pictures, Aww. his wife. And, you know, he has a daughter that looks exactly like Zanello when they were a certain age, you know. So I think for me, when I went to Zambia and he ghosted me, that's when I was like, you know what? It's true. Cool. It wasn't sad. even about me anymore. It was about because another reason I felt Zanello was acting out. I don't know which idiot while we were growing up told her that my husband is not her father. But she found out, she obviously found out over the years as we are dating that this man is not actually her father, Mm. you know. Um, But I had never told her. I had never introduced any other man to her, you know. So um, that's when now I think also the switch with her until she finally came out with it and told me, well, she don't even know who my father is. She thought I had kept him away from her, Mm. you know. And and, and that is when I then had to tell her the truth. You know, I tried, I tried, I tried to get him to meet with you, even just, you know, a video call or or just, you know, something or just, you know, a way to reach out to you so you can know who your father is. And I had to basically tell her that her father did not want her and that her father refused to play any sort of part in her life. It was difficult for me. It was very, very difficult for me, you know, but also it it, it helped us because now she no longer had this anger, like I yeah. kept her away from the yeah. opportunity of knowing and her biological father. And sense of expectation father. that my dad is out there somewhere trying to find me yeah. and mama But I think, you know, as we're wrapping up, I'm particularly also interested in, you know, the fact that you then eventually went on to get married and, you know, now you you have two sons, yeah. so, you know, uh, and you you mentioned at some point earlier before we started this that now you're even a grandma, but, yeah. you know, uh, so maybe just quickly just get us into your, your, your relationship with your husband. Yeah. Also, how that was, <laughs> right, for, for, you know, a, a teen mom and now eventually you get married, right? I think one thing that I'm loving about your story is it's a story of hope, right? But we'll get to that, you know, when we finally, uh, just as we, 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 we wrap up our conversation. But perhaps quickly just get us into, into yeah. that. Yeah, We're a weird, weird match, my husband and I. Yeah. So that is, it wasn't supposed to end up like this, you know, with this guy. Mm, mm. <laughs> when we met, um, one thing I always used to do every time I dated is the First thing I'd tell a guy is that, hey, I got a kid. Yeah. And yeah. also I needed to, because as much as I was in university in South Africa, um, what would happen was because I insisted that I was going to be a mother to my child, um, I'd come home every month. The first term, the first semester, I think I stayed away and it was a bit 
funny hake boane ka ronte betsenyana so after that i started to come home every single month and also she had natural hair and my mom was not managing with her natural hair so ngana ke ne ke feel like a role ba ka ro so i'd come back every month to come and do her hair and also just to see her and then when schools closed um i had a relationship with the lady who was the conductor on one of the buses that used to go often um so she would bring zanele to me Aww. and then i would put zani in preschool and then when i'm and i would used to do this with my allowance yako school i would never ask for my mom because i would insist for her to send her to me as well you know atla khon get that and she stayed with me for that month um school situation so this lady used to bring her from when she was still just small asanza le kananyana ansa go lanyana you know so she'd come and stay with me and i'd put her in preschool take her on my way to school pick her up after so hake jola the guys needed to know this because once every three or four months boom this girl's a mother right here you know mm. in Josie this is what's happening so they had to know so they had to yeah. know that you know you can't hide from your boyfriend for a whole month every few months mm. so it was one thing i always used to lead with and when i met um this gentleman you know it's one of the things also But that with him I wasn't even leading with it because the intention was not to date this guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I was told he is the biggest playboy ever, la khabaruni hure, he's going to break your heart. Don't even think about it. So what are you doing? Mm-hmm. I, and I was just like, yo, I was coming out of a relationship I was really crushed about. I said, yo, I never said I want to date this man. I said, guys. just tell him to come. You know they say the best way to get over a guy is under a guy. So <laughs> <laughs> that is what was supposed to happen. Yeah. And he just would not leave. Now, I would find this man parked in front of my complex gate get i thought khati you're a player fam what is this what, what are you what doing i'm trying to now. win my ex back i'm trying to you know what's your story except yeah. after two weeks he was telling me he loved me and he was creeping me out mm. then he wanted me to meet his mother and all of this happened within the first few weeks of oh, dating wow. he was really creeping me out get come down what the what this guy king mm. are you trying to prove a point what is going on yo we we struggled but and then i gave in um i gave in and you know instantly our relationship was just serious from the very get go we find out that we've got both got daughters they're the same age they're also six or seven months apart and you know we click it, it was fun yeah. um and then it got serious and then we started to not click Hey, that our relationship requires. So I think episode. that's a conversation for another day, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, I think you know, like I said earlier, one thing that I'm getting from your story, and thank you so much for sharing it, yeah. is inspiration, right? You know what somebody would perceive as, hey, what's her about? We're wasting your heart she. No, 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 no. That's not how it ended. And I think I'm curious to know how your conversation with teen moms are like. What do you say to them? You know, of course, because now you're drawing. from your own experience and here you are you're such a force you like i'm so inspired i am so inspired just listen to you and just your resilience your drive your positivity your enthusiasm about life it's really truly in- inspirational and uh, you know anyways i'll ask this but like what are your conversations with your with 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 teen moms yeah with the teen moms i had my teen mother program for about four years um You know, it was very difficult also. The reason I stopped it was very difficult for to get support for it because people felt like mm. you know. But ideally we we forget that this is happening no matter whether you tell them not to do it. Yeah, whether the conversations yeah. are being had or not, it's yeah. happening. Yeah. It's 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 rife. You know, it's real out here. There's a lot of teen moms and there's still it's still happening. So my conversation with teen moms generally was just that You know, when you have the first baby, it has to be a mindset shift. I taught them how to use their anger, their frustration, their downfalls to their advantage. Because for me, I felt a lot of my anger or my um, you know, I always say that I always wanted to prove a point to my mother. I was wanting to go she would say or you know my mother and I used to have the most ruthless arguments she used to say things that that you should never say to a child mm. and I can understand why you know I I cannot sit here and fault her we all struggle and deal with our pain in different ways and for me those triggering moments that for many years I used to be angry at her about 
I think are what made me what I am today. Mm-hmm. And for, for anybody else, you could take those moments and wallow and allow them to defeat you and go and seek solace in another guy's arms who's going to give you a second baby. Then you've got two babies from two different men, you know, and all of that. So I used to teach the team moms that use this now. Whether your situation is bad, whether Harunos Salang, you know, I used to open their eyes to places like um, YWCA, you know, being able to learn or continue your studies from home while feeding your child. You know, it, it is not a unique case to anybody. We had a helper, but I had to wake up at night yeah. and, and feed my child. Yeah. And, and study while you're and feeding And be expected yourself. to give results that were still positive. Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, yes, I skipped Halila Halila, but I wasn't the brightest pick of the bunch. I did well because I put a lot of effort. I put a lot of effort into myself. For me to pass, I had to put a lot of effort. So these are the things I would teach them that it's effort. Yeah. It's not that I was brilliant or I was intelligent. I'm not brilliant. I'm not intelligent. It's just that I took what was expected to be my downfall and wanted to show everybody that I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it and I'm going to be exactly what I want to be. Mm-hmm. So that for me was always what I would tell them. Even if on a, in a shack somewhere, put that picture up of that house. You know when they say write down where you want to be or what you want to do? Mood boards. Mood boards are very, very important. Because once you envision something, you know, you, you'll find yourself working towards it without even noticing. So these are the lessons that I would teach them. I'd give them examples from my life, you know, from my life during varsity, from my life um, during when I started working, you know. And it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all. It was really, really difficult. And also just, you have to govern yourself at a young age daily and remind yourself, you know, one of the things also for me that, um, ensured that things go the way they go is I knew what I I couldn't date a lot of guys, uh, you know, or at least because Akakwan now introduced a a new guy to one. You have a different scenario from your friends. You have to live differently from your friends. And it was a decision nobody had to force upon me, but I had to make for myself because I wanted to prove a point. So this is what I always used to teach them. Live to prove a point. Prove them wrong. They all expect you to fail. They all expect you to have a second baby. You know, stats stats around the world say that, um, I forgot what percent, I don't know if it's 76% back then, 76% of teen mothers are more likely to have a second child within the first two years. So these are the things that I used to drill into them that prove that point. Prove your mom, your grandmother that, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be that statistic. Tipi, thank you so much uh, you. for doing this. And once again, like I think your story is true testament, uh, you know, to the fact that life happens for us and not to us. Yes. Right. And, uh, you know, just hearing you speak, I can't help. And I know, you know, it's unfair possibly that I'd say this, but I feel like you were called for this because, you know, this is how, You are meant to serve humanity, to teach humanity, you know, to uh, extend through your experience these valuable lessons, you know, to to people beyond just teen moms, but to people like me, right? I've taught um, some old moms a lesson or two as well. Thank you very much about motherhood, (laughs) beyond just teen motherhood. But I'd like to believe you're doing so much better than a lot of moms who, you know, didn't have your kind of experience as teen mom. So thank you for doing this and happy Mother's Day. Thank you. And yeah, you know, there you have it. Uh, You know, these are the kind of conversations that really set my soul on fire. You know, these are the kind of stories that, you know, uh, I I really enjoy uh, facilitating and having people tell because ultimately they leave you very thought provoking, first of all, and they also just leave you changed you just cannot help but have a different perspective about life so make sure to subscribe to like to share to comment and yeah thank you for tuning in and thank you so much once again to yes thank you thank Mm. you for having me